Uh, I'm here today to tell a story about uh, what we've done uh, in the province of Saskatchewan in Canada. And we're going to tell a good, a good story about uh, how we've been able to convert a, a coal-fired power station at a production scale and um, extract the CO2 out of the exhaust gas and actually do something with it. We're very proud of this facility and uh, it's really been a, a journey over the last probably 15 years since we began to contemplate uh, what, the, uh, what the art of the possible was and bring it to reality. So with that, we'll... So that's a great little uh, intro video that our communications department put together just before we opened our facility last fall. Um, the person who actually has uh, spearheaded the, uh, this program since 2008 is Mike Manya. Now Mike Manya and I have the same initials. He's a little bit taller than I am. And he certainly attended a lot of conferences and many of you have probably met Mike uh, over the last few years. Uh, Mike has uh, really, um, uh, you know, he's, he has a passion for this uh, project and he has really uh, brought it home and he's carried the message about uh, our Boundary Dam 3 project around the world. But for those who uh, are not familiar with uh, Saskatchewan or uh, SAS Power, uh, just a little bit of background. We're the province that sits right over North Dakota and Montana. Montana is just under the southwest corner and North Dakota is under the southeast corner. Um, our province is the size roughly of Texas, just so you know. But we only have a little over one million people in the province. So we have more, we like to say we have more power poles than people in our province. And uh, so, and most of the population is in the lower half of the province. The, we, we tend to think of the Prairie provinces as big grain producers. Half the province is really uh, agriculture and potash mining in the south and the north, it's forest and, and rock and hard rock mining, uh, uranium, uh, gold, um, and forestry products uh, in the north. We're a little over 4,000 megawatts of total installed capacity. We say 151,000 kilometers of transmission line. I'm going to have to talk to my communication people. That's really 14,000 of, of high voltage transmission line and about 130,000 of uh, 35,000 of distribution line, so 25,000 volts and below. We have about a half a million customers in the province. Um, and we're experiencing probably 
something different than a lot of states and a lot of provinces are, are experiencing right now. We're in a significant growth period. We have had year-over-year -year growth. Uh, two years ago, it was 6.4%, six, six, uh, 6 and last year, uh, a little over 3%. So we've had about 10% growth in energy consumption over the last two years. Now, our supply mix is diversified. And as uh, Mr. Moeller said, uh, we, um, we have a, a portfolio of generation options available to us. We're not blessed with abundant hydro facilities uh, like uh, our neighbors in British Columbia or uh, further east in Ontario and Quebec. Um, and in the, in the past, uh, our percentage of coal generation was over 60%. But as time goes on and we add more gas generation and more renewables and the load continues to, to grow, our percentage of coal is actually uh, coming down. It's now about 44%. Gas is about 29%, hydro 20%. Uh, wind, uh, about 3% right now, and other would be imports and, uh, and small uh, generators provide about 4% of our energy. Now we have, uh, I, one of the, the topics in uh, Mr. Moeller's uh, um, speech this morning was about renewables and a couple of questions about renewables. Um, we have about 25% renewables, so if you conclude hydro and wind, uh, our percentage right now is about 25%. We continue to add uh, more additional wind to our, our fleet. Uh, we're putting in another uh, almost 200 megawatts of wind right now, and we'll be uh, putting out uh, more requests for additional wind over the next few years. So what, what we have here is um, just a, a picture of uh, uh, a drag line in operation. We have a mine mouth operation for our, our coal facilities, um, which makes it very handy. We uh, have uh, three coal-fired stations in the province. Uh, the Boundary Dam Station, currently about 650 megawatts. Our Poplar River Station, about 600 megawatts. And just a little to the east of uh, uh, the Boundary Dam Station is our Shand Power Station, which was the most environmentally um, uh, advanced station of its time when it went into uh, production in uh, 1992. Um, now, for those who are interested in the coal aspects of, of uh, our facility, uh, coal mining in Saskatchewan, probably just like Montana, North Dakota, dates back to 1857. Um, it was one of the earliest commodities to be mined in the province. The coal we burn is uh, Western Canadian lignite, which has a very low heating value and a low percentage of sulfur. Uh, our coal comes from a, a different number of seams that vary, but um, typically um, there's 40 to 50 feet of overburden, which gets pulled off, and the, and the coal seams are anywhere from 3 feet to uh, 15 feet in, in uh, depth. Now, our heating value, just so you know, is, uh, varies between about 5,400 to uh, 6,200 BTUs per pound, so it's very, very low. It requires us to build big boilers in order to convert that, uh, that coal energy into uh, heat energy and then uh, into uh, electrical energy. Our moist the moisture content, content of our coal is 34 to 38 percent. Ash content, 12 to 14 percent. Sulfur, um, half, between a half and one percent, depending on the, the seam that we're mining. Now, the coal for our three power stations currently is mined by uh, Westmoreland Coal, which operates throughout Canada and the U.S., There's a picture of our uh, 75 cubic meter bucket for those that haven't been up close and personal to a drag line before. Now, with respect to the regulations um, that we currently have to work in in Canada, um, we started construction on the, on the carbon capture facility prior to federal regulations coming into effect. So we, we began construction in May of uh, 2011. And on September 5th, 2012, the Canadian uh, Federal Greenhouse Gas Regulations on coal-fired plants became a reality. Um, these regulations are actually coming into effect this year on July 1st, 2015. And essentially, the regulation requires new and existing facilities to operate as clean as natural gas facilities. The regulation is 420 tons of CO2 per, per gigawatt hour. Boundary Dam's Unit 3 was 1,100 tons, but today, with 90% capture, uh, with our carbon capture facility, we'll operate at full capacity 
and emit only 140 tons of CO2, essentially three times cleaner than a natural gas facility. It's a little snapshot of uh, the, uh, the regulations in both Canada and the U.S., uh, 420 in Canada for modified and, and refurbished coal units, which is what, what we did. We refurbed uh, an existing nominal 150 megawatt uh, uh, generator, and um, it was nearing the end of life, and we had to make that decision. For new coal or natural gas units, uh, the uh, target is still the same in Canada, uh, slightly lower in the U.S., now, I said before that we have a mixed portfolio in, uh, in Saskatchewan. We have coal, we have gas. Um, the base load cost for natural gas uh, is uh, represented on the slide here, capital investment being fairly small, but the fuel cost and the fuel risk over the long term is something that most utilities are, uh, are certainly concerned about. Uh, retrofitting the Boundary Dam 3 uh, with a carbon capture facility attached to it uh, provides what I think everybody in this room is looking for, long-term stable price for the coal, for the fuel, uh, much higher capital cost in the beginning, but over the life of that plant, uh, we see a very um, good economic uh, case being made. We also have another uh, very valuable benefit in Saskatchewan, in the part of the province where Boundary is situated, there's also oil and gas reserves. And we are able to use that CO2 uh, and make it commercially available to an oil and gas company. So Boundary Dam, the name is a bit of a misnomer. When you say Boundary Dam, people think, oh, there's a, there's a hydro facility down there. But the, the name Boundary actually comes from the U.S.-Canada border, the Boundary. And uh, the dam is the, uh, the reservoir that you see behind. There's just to the left of the screen, there's a, there's a dam that holds back the water in that reservoir for, for cooling water for that power station. And it's called Boundary, Boundary Dam. Um, I worked there for many years, uh, know the place intimately. Uh, all hours of the uh, day and night when you're working in a power station and in a utility um, makes you very, very familiar. Units, there, it was originally a six-unit station. We retired two of the units in 2013. Uh, unit one and unit two were retired in 2013 and 2014. They were 62 megawatt units apiece, built in 1958. Uh, and they were on the very left-hand side of the screen where the roof is a little bit lower there. Uh, and then units three, four, five, and six are the, are the four stacks that you see there. Unit three, four, and five are each 150 megawatt uh, units and unit six at the on the right hand side is a 300 megawatt uh, boiler and uh, and generator set. Now what you see at the right uh, to the right of the power station is the carbon capture facility, and um, you can see I'll try to use this right here. You'll see uh, this is duct work that's coming from the back of the power station. Um, where the exhaust gas was going up the stack, we, we installed um, uh, a set of big dampers. The, this ductwork right here, uh, you can imagine, is um, probably 16 feet high and about 12 feet wide. Um, pulls that exhaust gas from the back of this unit over here, all the way around the back of the power station and over into the carbon capture facility. Now, for constructing this facility, uh, we used over 60 companies. Um, our, our prime engineering uh, contractor was SNC-Lavalin. Uh, we had about 1,700 workers on site at the max, and um, we clocked about 5 million man-hours on the construction of this facility uh, with no lost time injuries, so we're very, very proud of that. And we launched the, uh, this facility in October of last year, and we had over 20 countries uh, represented at the, uh, at the opening ceremony. Now here's, here's a snapshot of what uh, Boundary Dam looked like uh, you know, prior to carbon capture and post-carbon capture. Um, megawatts, this is a net megawatts here, 139. It was a nominal 150 megawatts gross, so you take station service off and you're down to 139. Uh, Post-carbon capture, we retrofitted the boiler and the turbine um, when we're not extracting CO2 out of the, out of the uh, exhaust, uh, we can now generate 160 
megawatts gross. Um, so that would work out to about 149, 150 net without, if we, if we weren't using the CCS facility. And with um, the uh, SO2 extraction and the uh, carbon dioxide extraction, uh, the, the parasitic load actually takes the net down to about 120. Um, carbon dioxide, um, a million tons here. They, we put the K in there. I wish they would have put uh, uh, something different. Um, post post uh, carbon capture, 112, uh, reducing the output of uh, carbon dioxide by uh, 90%. Sulfur dioxide has been reduced to essentially zero. Um, through the process, we extract all the sulfur dioxides. We put it through a, sulf a sulfuric acid plant and, and uh, manufacture sulfuric acid, which we have contracts now for and, and are selling. Nitrous oxides, um, again, cutting by more than half. And this is a particulate matter here, PM. This is 10 micron size, uh, two and a half micron size. So you can see that we've uh, certainly reduced uh, all the uh, um, harmful stuff as well as the particulate matter coming out of that stack uh, by a significant amount. So 150,000 tons have been captured uh, since October. This was as of about two weeks ago. Um, minimum of 80% uh, of CO2 captured, so accounting for uh, uh, the performance of the plant up to this point in time, the operating hours, uh, um, and, and ramping up the, uh, the facility in the, in the first few weeks of operation. Um, we are still working towards the 90% uh, uh, captured at full efficiency, but we are achieving the 80% target uh, today. 120 megawatts net to the grid. When we designed this facility, we based it on a net output of 110 megawatt hours. Um, that's what our economic calculations were based on. We're getting less parasitic load than what we originally had uh, estimated, which is a very, very good thing. It's going to help... Uh, make the economics uh, uh, much more positive as we look to the next decision. And the quality of the CO2 that we're producing using the technology that we've installed at this uh, carbon capture facility, which is an amine technology, so it's a post-combustion amine technology, very familiar to the oil and gas industry. Uh, we're producing 99 point, actually 99% uh, pure CO2. Um, very close to food grade. We're looking at actually now uh, installing a, a slipstream process and, and uh, taking out whatever is left there in order to make it food grade quality and then we would sell that product at a premium price uh, and uh, uh, earn a little more revenue than we're earning today. So uh, to do the math, a uh, million tons a year, that's like taking uh, uh, all the cars off the road in Regina and there's about uh, uh, our population of our city, which is the capital city of the province, is about 220,000. Um, we estimate, uh, as Mr. Moller said earlier, uh, 10, million, 10 million tons is about uh, uh, 2 million cars. Uh, we're, we say, two, 250,000 automobiles off the road. Um, capturing all the CO2 from the heating and cooling of, of every home. We use natural gas in the wintertime. Uh, and uh, we need air conditioning in the summer. It's not snow, it doesn't snow up there all year round, just so you know. Um, it's, uh, we, we experience, uh, you know, 100 degrees in the summertime and uh, minus 40 in the wintertime. So we have, a, you know, high extremes in the, in the province. And uh, also keeping the lights on in, in half the city. So uh, it's, a, it's a phenomenal achievement. And I think, uh, you know, it just, it demonstrates uh, what is possible when, uh, a facility like this is, is actually installed uh, uh, in an operating electrical syst system and um, the, the benefits uh, accrue to everybody. Now the big question people want to know is about, okay, how much did this cost and uh, how much is it continuing to cost? Um, at this point in time, I can say that we are uh, achieving better than expected uh, operation out of the plant, but we're still in the first six months of operation. We haven't quite reached full capacity yet as we work out, you know, to, to, just like any other power station that goes in, it takes several months uh, uh, 
to to work out a lot of the issues, and we continue to work on that. And we expect to have uh, we expect to be in full capacity by about June this year. Um, but based on um, the the price of natural gas um, in Canada at the time, and this this is these figures are from 09 to 010, so this is about the time we were putting together uh, our business case for this one. Um, the um, the price of uh, uh, traditional coal-fired generation in the $55 to $60 a megawatt hour coal with carbon capture uh, was priced in the, between the 90 and just under 110 at the time. Uh, natural gas, of course, um, um, wide range there. That goes from simple cycle to combined cycle gas uh, from 50 up to about uh, 80. Um, nuclear, which we don't have any in our province, but, but there's a few facilities in Canada. And of course, biomass and wind uh, having the, uh, the highest cost per installed megawatt um, at the time. Uh, the, the argument for um, coal with carbon capture in our system, in, in the province of Saskatchewan, uh, really was helped by the location of that facility, as I said earlier, in the southeast corner of the province where we have uh, large oil and gas reserves. And we're able to uh, with the uh, additional revenue, we're able to pull that number uh, even lower using the, the revenue from the CO2 to help offset uh, the installed cost of that facility. Um, now, because of the, uh, the nature of the contract we have with uh, Synovus, who's the off-taker of CO2, and they, they're buying uh, all uh, uh, 1 million tons a year from us, um, you know, I can't divulge the exact figure, but uh, we're just going to paint this picture that uh, helps illustrate that uh, with the proper utilization of, uh, of carbon capture technology, uh, the proximity of oil and gas reserves and our ability to uh, enter into a contract to sell that uh, CO2, uh, we've now, uh, we now have an economic case uh, that, that we were able to take to our board of directors and we were able to get this project approved. And with the performance that we're seeing now, which is, which is better than we've uh, expected, um, you know, it'll help us as we look towards the next decision point that we have to make on Unit 4 and 5. So again, two more 150 megawatt units slated for retirement in 2019. We, are, we want to have a full year of operation at full load uh, uh, performance uh, d design criteria in order to really prove out the economics of this plant and to be able to build a proper economic case. We expect to have that decision at the end of 2016, beginning of 2017, and uh, make that decision on whether we are going to go ahead with uh, retrofitting two more units uh, in our fleet. So we've got a few slides on the actual carbon capture facility. Um, brand new facility. For those of you that have been at a coal-fired power station, things don't usually look this clean. Um, there's usually a, a kind of a gray-black smudge over everything, uh, but um, this facility is uh, brand new. The, uh, the structures that you see on the left there are the uh, SO2 and the CO2 absorber towers, and I'll just uh, I'll get into that uh, shortly. And um, coming out of the top part of the stack here, that's, uh, that's clean exhaust coming out of there, so 90% of the CO2 has been scrubbed out of the uh, exhaust stream uh, right here. On the on this, on this uh, part of the facility, that's the CO2 stripper. So the, uh, the amine captures the uh, carbon dioxide uh, in the process. Um, we put it through the, the, the plant, which is essentially a chemical plant, not a, not a utility plant. It's a chemical plant. We strip out the, uh, the carbon dioxide in the, in the CO2 stripper and um, um, recycle the amines in the process. So uh, um, the process has uh, been working, uh, been working well, and the consumption of amines uh, um, is, uh, is very low right now, and that, which is promising as well, because you don't want to have to start re replenishing amines in this process, because that will, again, tip the balance on the uh, on the cost of the plant. Now just to the right of the plant, you, uh, just off the screen here is the compressor, compressor building. So where we take the CO2 out of the, out of the exhaust gas, we then compress it 
uh, to uh, just about 1,800 PSI and uh, put it in the pipeline and uh, ship it to uh, Synovus. And they take it about um, um, eight kilometers from this facility that's their takeoff point and uh, it goes into their pipeline system. Now this, this project has cost uh, to date uh, a little under $1.5 billion. Um, this is a uh, production scale facility. Uh, the initial uh, estimate on this uh, particular project was about $1.24 billion. We received $240 million from uh, uh, our, the federal government of Canada, which contributed to this project, um, and, and uh, that occurred uh, you know, from 2011 up until last year. We do know, based on our experience and uh, some of the uh, issues we had uh, that developed during the construction of this facility, we, we do firmly believe that we could build another facility like this for uh, uh, 20, some of my engineers are saying, maybe up to 30% less than, uh, than we currently experienced here, which is very, very promising. So together with the uh, good operating performance and the ability to uh, construct this facility at a lower capital cost will, uh, will help make the economics uh, look even brighter. So this is a, a picture of the carbon dioxide and uh, sulfur dioxide absorbers. Um, just a, a couple little facts. The CO2 absorber is uh, 14 stories high. Um, the smaller tower is the CO2, or pardon me, the SO2 absorber right here. This is the CO2 absorber, 14 stories high. Um, they were built, uh, they're constructed of a, a, a brick, so they went up uh, kind of one foot at a time when they were being built. Um, to eliminate degradation of the walls and the inside, over 70,000 ceramic tiles were used to make up the interior. Industrial ceramic tile is known for its durability and chemical resiliency, and the absorber can withstand temperatures of up, up to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, this is the CO2 stripper, which is the larger of the two vessels, and you're only seeing the part that's actually sticking out of the, the roof here. It, uh, it actually goes another 100 feet down uh, into, the, into the building. Um, the SO2 stripper is found within the facility itself, so you can't see it here. And... Uh, the, the reason the CO2 stripper is much larger is because there's several times uh, the amount of uh, amine is used in the, uh, in the carbon dioxide uh, stripping process than, um, than the SO2 stripping, so, and slightly different amine solutions. Um, large vessels also add additional heat to the amine solution, and this, this stripper separates the carbon dioxide gas from the amine solvent uh, to be recycled back through the system. This uh, uh, vessel was fabricated in Alberta, Canada, and this was the largest piece of equipment uh, hauled on uh, highways in our, in our province uh, to date. Um, and just a note, as I said earlier, amine technology has been used in the oil and gas industry uh, and the LNG industry for over 50 years, uh, but uh, we chose the technology uh, uh, when we designed and, and built this facility. This picture is actually a, a, um, uh, of the SO2 stripper found inside the carbon capture facility. Um, the, this particular shot is taken on about the third floor, so you have two workers here. There's one fella in behind here, another fella here. Um, the SO2 stripper follows the same process to remove SO2 as the previous uh, CO2 stripper that was shown, but using a f far less of a completely different amine solvent solution. Now that, the amine technology was provided by CanSolve. Uh, they own the technology, the amine technology, and um, uh, as I said earlier, um, SNC Lavalin was the uh, prime EPC contractor on this site. 100% of our produced uh, sulfur dioxide is captured using this process. Now this is the sulfuric acid plants. Um, it's the first of its kind to have been integrated in, into uh, any form of a, a chemical uh, carbon capture and storage facility. Um, it's especially unique uh, because it's uh, vertically built, uh, so it's higher than it is wide, uh, and they stack the components uh, vertically to, to save space. Uh, the job of the acid plant is to facilitate the chemical process that transforms captured SO2 into commercial-grade sulfuric acid, which uh, we then sell. Our sulfuric acid is 96% pure, and we produce about uh, one and a half semi-loads a day. 
uh, of sulfuric acid. So sulfuric acid, just so that you know, is used for fertilizer, agricultural pesticides, and other industrial uses and other chemical processes. And after compression, this is the, uh, the, the pipeline uh, that is just uh, before it exits the plant and uh, hits the pipeline to uh, go to the off-taker. Um, we use, uh, you can't see it in this particular photograph, but there's a dehydrator and an eight-stage compressor. Uh, this comp the compressor is a German-built uh, multi-stage compressor, 18,000 horsepower. Uh, this S uh, the CO2 compressor first eliminates moisture, then compresses the, uh, the carbon dioxide uh, to uh, transform it into a very dense um, state. Um, and as I said, it goes to the pipeline to Synovus Energy. Uh, they use it for enhanced oil recovery. Um, now, in addition to the, um, addition to the uh, off-taker Synovus uh, taking right now 100% of the CO2 that's produced, we also have a deep underground storage facility, which we call Aquastor. It's a saline reservoir that's about 10,000 feet underground, so, so uh, a little over 3,000 meters. Uh, that facility right now is, is just being charged, so they are, they are uh, um, starting to charge that Aquastore facility and, and uh, beginning the process to inject carbon, diox carbon dioxide into that saline reservoir 10,000 feet underground. It's the deepest well in the province. Um, a lot of interest on the part of the academic uh, uh, community uh, for uh, the geology of underground uh, uh, carbon dioxide storage. Um, uh, the University of Regina, the uh, Petroleum Technology Research Center that we have in uh, Regina are uh, doing the measurements and monitoring and verification of, uh, of uh, the, the process itself. And uh, over the next uh, few years, we hope to be able to uh, have a lot of data uh, that um, would be a very, much of, uh, very much of interest, I think, to the, to the academic community. So um, Securing off-takers for the products out of this facility uh, certainly helped to make the business case. So the sale of carbon dioxide for enhanced oil recovery, sale of sulfuric acid uh, out of that plant, and there's about uh, uh, 600,000 pounds a year being produced of sulfuric acid. And of course, fly ash. Um, we do have uh, precips uh, that uh, take uh, a lot of the heavy particulate out of the uh, out of the exhaust before it goes into the uh, amine process, um, and we, we sell that fly ash product as well. Now the storage, as I was just mentioning earlier, um, uh, pure CO2 storage um, uh, goes to a, um, a deep well that we call Aquastar. Um, 10,000 feet down is the, is the saline um, aquifer down here, so it's going to be uh, injected down here through this entire layer. There's several different geologic formations which provide hard cap. Uh, so there's many different aquifers as you go down, but the, the deep one is down here where the uh, CO2 is going to be injected. So many, many different layers. Uh, and I'm not a geologist, so uh, uh, I, I won't be able to answer any of those kind of questions if they are. But uh, we, um, uh, we're very optimistic that we're going to have a, um, a very good uh, solution here. In the event that we um, can't sell the CO2 uh, for whatever reason the off-taker off might not need it, uh, we can then inject that into the saline reservoir. But the, uh, the predominant use of that carbon dioxide is going to be for enhanced oil recovery. So with, um, with the Boundary Dam facility at one power station and just about 10 kilometers away, we have another power station, a 300 megawatt Shand facility. Uh, we've also constructed a carbon capture test facility. Um, it's the first of its kind facility and it will allow international partners to try out new technologies and methods in carbon capture. We currently have a partnership with Hitachi Power Systems uh, for when the facility opens this June. Uh, we also have a brand new um, world leading amine chemical lab that we're uh, uh, going to be using to test the effectiveness of new amine-based solvents and other chemical processes. So 
Uh, we're developing uh, labs to uh, really uh, perfect the technology and the, uh, the, the processes around carbon capture from coal-fired stations. In addition to that, we formulated a global consortium to share our knowledge with private sector, government institutions, universities, and non-profit organizations who want to learn more about our expertise in carbon capture and storage. Uh, this consortium will share information we've uncovered um, in the way of significant cost reductions, training, uh, some of the uh, learnings that we had through the construction and commissioning process, and certainly as we gather information on the performance of this plant, uh, that information will become available as well. We also provide tours. If you're ever uh, able to uh, get up to uh, Saskatchewan, we're only a couple hours north of the U.S. border. The plant itself is, uh, is only about uh, 20 miles north of the U.S. border, so it's uh, uh, not that far. Um, we've had 30 representatives from 30 companies, and probably well over 1,000 people have toured this facility over the last year. Uh, we welcome anyone who wants to come and visit this facility. We will uh, provide a guided tour for people, uh, uh, delegates from this conference. Uh, I extend that invitation to, uh, to come to Saskatchewan and uh, uh, see this facility firsthand. And if you can't make it to Estevan, we have another way um, for you to tour this facility. You can do it online. Um, uh, go to the website saspowerccs.com slash tour for a virtual tour of Boundary Dam, which provides uh, a little more information on our process and viewing of the critical components that, uh, that make up this project. With this project being the first of its kind in the world, we're definitely going to be learning uh, a lot and we're going to be answering a lot of questions as we go. Uh, this is a world first and we're very proud of it. Um, as global power production increases in countries like uh, China and Germany look to uh, continue developing coal power. They're, they're looking to us to see how uh, they can do it in a more environmentally sustainable way. Uh, so with the Knowledge Sharing Consortium, uh, where we're inviting uh, world governments and companies to learn from our experience so that carbon capture and storage deployment can move forward, as just one of the, uh, the answers to climate change. It's not going to be the only one. It's a, we, we call it another tool in the toolbox. With our portfolio of generation. We're going to continue to add more wind. We're, we're looking at biomass projects. Uh, to the extent we can add additional hydro into our fleet, we will, we will do that as well. So this provides uh, that tool that allows uh, countries like Canada and the U.S. to provide uh, energy from a, a, a source that we have, we have in the ground that we know the, the cost of. It's a very stable uh, fuel and, uh, and the process to convert that to electricity has been known for a long, long time. We're very proud of what we've been able to achieve at Boundary and we certainly look forward to the opportunity to uh, share our success with, with you and with that I'll end my presentation.